Hi everyone, it's really great that you can join us today. If you haven't had, uh, if we haven't had the pleasure to meet yet, I'm Tiffany Sang, head of DB LGPS Investment at the PLSA. After a tumultuous few years, I think many of us here would probably prefer a calmer 2023 in more ways than one. But inflation worries, expectations of lower economic growth, looming recessions, ongoing fundamental shifts in how we integrate climate change risk or social factors, and the need to stay alert to continued and emerging global global political crises means that those of you in this virtual room who are in positions of investment decision-making power are, of course, constantly needing to monitor the macroeconomic landscape to best balance the risks and returns. So we have three guests today, all ready to go, all masters of their craft, who will navigate us through some of these very complex and interrelated issues in the macroeconomic landscape and offer us some insight on what are the key things that we should be thinking about for our pension investments in the coming year. So first up, will be Vivek Paul. He is head of portfolio research and is UK chief investment strategist at BlackRock Investment Institute. He'll, he'll speak more on this, but he'll focus on pricing the damage of a potential recession, rethinking bonds, and living with uh, inflation now. He'll explore how these three themes will impact the UK economy and in turn, how pension funds should position their portfolios. Then we have the pleasure of having Kim Katakis. He is investment strategist at Franklin Templeton Institute, and he will focus on the themes of economic regime change, risk premium, debt, and he'll examine how governments are reacting to these, these issue areas, among other things, of course. And last, of, but of course not least on our panel is our very own John Chilman. He is CEO of RailPen and the chair of our PLSA policy board. John will come on screen after Kim and um, Vivek and give his reactions to their positions from a pension schemes perspective. So there will be a discussion with all three. You'll get to ask your questions as always. So please do jot down notes and put them through the question box as we go through. I'll try, I promise to get through as many of them as we can. Before I turn it over to the speakers, I actually wanted to ask you in the audience a question to help set the stage a bit. Um, we would love to gauge your predictions on the evolving macroeconomic landscape. So I'm going to ask our colleagues to put up a polling question, which you should have on your screen now. So please join us in putting your vote through. So the question is, how do you see inflation evolving over a medium to long term horizon? So I'll just read them out uh, while we're doing the selection, falling below pre-pandemic levels falling but staying above pre-pandemic levels, falling back to pre-pandemic levels, or staying around current high levels. It seems as if now the, the popular vote is 87% falling but staying above pre-pandemic levels. So interesting. So 10% of you did say falling back to pre-pandemic levels, the optimistic view in the audience. So, okay, I'm going to now stop talking and turn it over to our experts. So Vivek, can I please ask you to come on screen and um, Say hello to our audience. Okay, hi, hi Tiffany, hi everybody. Great to be here, um, and it's a very opportune time. Uh, I would have voted with the majority in the uh, in the poll that we just had, and maybe if I use that as as a base to kind of talk a little bit about like how we're seeing this uh, landscape now and what it means for the UK and for UK pension funds. My background is in pensions. I'm an actuary. I spent much of my career advising UKDB. Um, I now am the head of portfolio research at the BlackRock Investment Institute, as Tiffany mentioned up front. So um, the first point, I guess, I know Kim's going to talk a bit more about this, but I think it's really important to, to set the scene when we're thinking about the themes. We believe we're in a new macro regime. We believe this is a regime of harsher trade-offs for policymakers. Um, and what that means is, whereas in the last 30 to 40 years of the great moderation uh, central bankers could prioritize growth and inflation kind of at the same time. They can't do that now. Think about the debate that's been going on in markets right now. You know, markets are second guessing where the Federal Reserve will pause or pivot or where the Bank of England will pause or pivot. And that causes gyrations up and down in terms of equity markets. This is all due to this central theme of this new regime that it's harder to be able to prioritize and stabilize both at the same time. And 2023 is a year in which we're going to go from the politics of inflation being the dominant thing to the politics of interest rates and recession uh, and growth being the dominant thing. And that, uh, that dynamic, that transition is what makes this environment particularly volatile and difficult uh, to navigate. 
So the reason why this is different is because supply pressures are dominating. And that's the reason why we think uh, those uh, inflation dynamics will stay persistent. Uh, they'll come down from current high levels, but they will stay persistent because we're in an environment where the longer run trends are manifesting, which mean that supply will be the dominant driver of inflation. What that means then in terms of key themes uh, for making sense of 2023 globally and in the UK it's all about for us being able to think about pricing the damage, right? In an environment where markets move a lot, where there are competing narratives going on, what is in the price? Is it fair to be uh, sort of invested long in terms of risk assets now uh, or in government bonds right now, given uh, the, the, the dynamic and how quickly the market perception can change? So that is a key point, pricing the damage. And I'll come on to what that means for the UK. Another key point is the idea of rethinking the role of bonds. Uh, we think that uh, fixed income might well play a large role for many, maybe even a larger role than it did in the past, but maybe that mix of fixed income might be a little bit different. And we should talk a little bit about what that means for de-risking in the context of, of DB as well. And the other thing I want to talk about is this idea of living with inflation, that other key theme. We believe, as I said, this will be persistent for a, for a period of time. So thinking about the UK in particular with regards to this, pricing the damage, we've seen material moves in uh, UK large cap uh, earnings, uh, and and generally speaking, we've seen you know the the uh, the equity index kind of go to in the vicinity of of all time highs. But for us, I think the, the the worry is that there is more damage yet to be priced that isn't currently in the price. So that's a UK story. And that's a global story. So we remain cautious in the near run because there is a recession that's going to occur. The lagged effects of rate hikes that have not fully been seen in market pricing to date. And we think, you know, the fact that many are still thinking about the potential of a soft landing makes us cautious. Rethinking bonds. Go back to the heady uh, events of uh, late last year and uh, previous prime minister, huge blowout in UK guilt yields. I know everyone, we're very familiar with that. That, thankfully, in large part is in the rearview mirror. But the idea of term premium, the idea of the credibility of the UK institutions, it could again come into the picture as we get closer to the next general election, as we get closer to the idea of the government wanting to make this an election issue. So we think there's room for yields to rise from here for UK government bonds. That has an implication when we're thinking about de-risking, and I'll come on to that in a second. And living with inflation. Um, we're in an environment where inflation is going to be structurally a little bit higher, and the UK perhaps faces a little bit more of the challenges than everywhere else. We have the, uh, the the demographics problem the, broad, the broader developed market world has. We have the labor supply issues that the US is experiencing. We have an element of the energy reliance issues that Europe is experiencing. But we also have this dynamic where our political landscape is very much you know, and not in favor of more immigration. We think uh, unless that changes, the supply issues are likely to persist and cause upper pressure on UK inflation. So in terms of what that means for the portfolios, and I want to kind of wrap this up quickly because I know we're short on time, uh, the, what, what it means in terms of portfolios, we would be building portfolios with a bias towards inflation-linked assets. Uh, we find the opportunities in, uh, in particularly in the US inflation-linked market as attractive right here and right now. The fixed income portfolio would look a little bit different. We'd have more in IG credit than we would have done in the past. Uh, we think that you know UK gilt yields could indeed rise from here, but the decision on, on the de-risking uh, story is much more in terms of where you are as a pension fund in terms of your journey. And for the specifics of that mean that if you are more in the camp of uh, needing to take less risk, that probably means that you'd still wear the idea of yields potentially rising and, and de-risk more. If you're more at the start of your journey or if you're kind of in the DC space, actually private markets playing a larger role is something that we'd really consider. So I'm sure we'll come back to many of these points later on, but maybe for now, Tiffany, I'll, I'll pause there. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Kim, can I invite you to come on screen, please? Okay, so um, thanks for that. So, uh, Vivek, I, uh, we've got a lot of common ground there. We're not completely um, in agreement on everything, but I think we're, we've got a lot of common ground. So my perspective, I'll take you back a couple of steps, right? Let's get some perspective here. So I've been an investor for 34 years, and what I would suggest is that the biggest takeaway for me right now is that we have come to a real um, sight and vendor, as the Germans say, you know, real change of eras. So the first thing I would say is that, you know, the growth that we've seen over the last 25, 30 years globally, economic growth, that is, has been pretty damn good. 
And uh, looking forward, I'd say there's a lot of challenges to getting anywhere near that in the future. Some of these are short term and probably likely to fall away, but others are structural. One of the structural ones, obviously, is demographics, you know, the developed world and the countries that have generally powered economic growth for the world over the last 25 years, which is namely the US, the European Union and China since 2008, are all getting older and pretty fast. Um, on top of that, we've got a complicating factor, which is the return of geopolitics as a factor. The reason why geopolitics is important for investors is because essentially it influences government policy. And if it influences government policy, then it's going to have an impact on your investment return expectations. One real tangible example of that is the fact that we've taken a commodity like oil that we used to think about as totally fungible and made it non-fungible in the sense that today you have good oil, which is coming from Norway, from you know North Sea, from uh, the US, and you have bad oil that comes from Russia and Iran, and the two are priced differently. Now, that is something that is going to impact a lot of commodities uh, in, in other spaces as well. Um, what that leads to naturally is because of the geopolitical tensions and interest in national security, that is going to lead to more intervention by governments. Now, whether the intervention is coming, as we've already seen in terms of helping citizens during the pandemic, or whether it's going to be a guiding, uh, or perhaps depending on your point of view, maybe an obstacle to um, you know full investment in all sorts of areas around the world, as we've we've seen uh, in the past, um, that is going to have an influence again on your investment return expectations. Now it's not all doom and gloom because obviously in this environment, what we're seeing is that the change of eras that I was talking about is resulting in a lot of great new opportunities. One of them is, and related to the commodity that I picked on earlier, the oil one, we have essentially supercharged, particularly in Europe, um, our timeline for the green energy uh, transition. Um, every project that may not have been 100% economically viable two years ago is suddenly looking a lot more attractive. And I think what that's going to do is channel an awful lot of investments in that direction. Another one, which perhaps is less happy is that we are actually going to see um, big increases in defense spending, not just the NATO members, but lots of countries around the world. So what this does essentially is it creates a, a, another source of short-term inflationary pressure. You know, some of that pressure is going to come for the very simple reason that, you know, the military industrial complex has not exactly got a lot of spare capacity. Uh, so any increase in orders is going to create that kind of pressure. Um, similarly for the green transition firms. Um, who are the winners in all of this? Well, I would suggest that, you know, you've got countries that are going to be winners, uh, countries that are going to be beneficiaries, for example, of the continuing um, reorganization or recalibration of global supply chains away from dependence on one country, particularly China in this case. So what that means is countries like Mexico um, benefit on a whole lot of levels. One of them is they've already got a burgeoning infrastructure called maquiladoras um, in place. Those are businesses that are used to subcontracting and manufacturing you know, from big multinationals who are selling into the North American uh, free trade zone. And um, they also have the advantage in that unit labor costs in, in Mexico are now a fraction of China's um, rather than what it was in 2001 when China joined the WTO. Um, another big advantage they've got is that the infrastructure of logistics of moving goods north is already there and it's it's plentiful. So the, the whole ecosystem that they have um, makes them very attractive for friend shoring, as we call it. Um, another country that may be a big beneficiary, this is Indonesia, because Indonesia has the benefit of have it being rich in natural resources, and on top of that, having a very big population, a big consumer market that is growing, a larger middle class coming, and uh, it is strategically situated as well. So I think that's that's another example. And in terms of companies, clearly, as I've already mentioned, you know, companies that are involved in the green technology um, restructuring, you know, the civil engineering side of it or whatever, will also be uh, clearly benefiting. And what's very important to remember is that in the West they are going to be benefiting at the expense of perhaps more competitive in terms of price Chinese companies that are increasingly going to be squeezed out of that space, much as we've seen in telecoms already. 
Um, another area to look at is uh, companies um, that are involved in the straightforward, what I would call, um, investment in um, re modernization of of industrial plant. So you think about it, you know, an example would be, you know, a, a big chemical company like BASF, you know, and um, Friedrichshafen is, is one of the biggest integrated plants in the world. Um, what they're doing is um, investing for the first time in about 40 years in the actual plant and machinery there, which is clearly going to make them a lot more efficient in terms of uses of gas. So this we're going to see a lot of these kind of things happening in industrial companies. Those that can bring forward CapEx to modernize their plant are going to get the benefit of lower operating expenses looking out over many years. Um, it's not something that, you know, in, intuitively, uh, maybe a year ago, investors would have welcomed uh, because they would have said, oh, what you're doing is sacrificing short-term returns. You don't need to because these plants already depreciated. But actually, um, it makes sense in today's world. Um, and then, you know, perhaps uh, thinking in on, on another level, um, we, we, we have to be alert to the implications that all of these changes are having in terms of our quantification of risk premiums in different countries. So it's going to be much more important to think about you know, not just the sovereign financials, you know, uh, debt to GDP, et cetera, and what the Standard & Poor's rating is for foreign, for, for local denominated debt. You, you, there's going to be a lot of debt issuance coming. Uh, that debt issuance is coming from a whole lot of different governments. Um, and there's going to be debt issuance coming from companies as well. Now, what this is going to do essentially is drive a wedge and increase the polarization between those countries that can finance and refinance. And to the next point, credibility is hugely important here. I cannot overestimate that. Um, and uh, those that cannot, those that perhaps are viewed a bit skeptically from the bond markets, you know, they're not particularly keen to, they'll put a higher price on, on lending to them. So both companies and countries will be split essentially into those that are credible, good, in very commas, um, uh, good operators, and as a result, will find it easier to finance at reasonable prices. And in this world, clearly that I'm describing, if you are an asset owner or you're an investor, it's actually a really good place to be because there's a lot of moving thing, moving parts, and there's new opportunities that we haven't seen before. And um, broadly speaking, the general themes and trends are relatively straightforward and, and transparent. I'll stop there. Okay, so Kim leaves us on a positive, optimistic note, which is which is always great. So I just want to bring on John to give his reactions to what he's just heard, uh, some really important insights that's just set us up for the rest of this session. Um, so put your, your questions in, in, in the chat box when, when you can. But before we... Uh, I turn this over to John. I would just like the audience again to participate with us on two more polling questions. So this is really in reflection, uh, asking you to, to to give us your reflections rather uh, on asset allocation and portfolio construction. So the first question, question number two, do you expect higher or lower allocation to fixed income assets versus equities over a strategic horizon as a result of higher yields? So answer one, higher allocation to fixed income relative equity. Number two, lower allocation to fixed income relative to equity. Third, same allocation, but I expect the mix with them to change. And the last one, same allocation at the aggregate and granular level. The majority of you, 55%, said higher allocation to fixed income relative to equity. And then 28% of you said same allocation, but you expect the mix to change. And then a smaller percentage of you, 14%, lower allocation to fixed income relative to equity. Okay, that's really interesting. So we're going to move on to the third one to give us just to give us a better gauge as well to what you're thinking. So the polling for the third question is, what is your allocation to private markets? So this one's a bit more straightforward, less than 5%, 5 to 15 or more than 15. So again, what is your allocation to private markets? Less than 5%, 5 to 15, more than 15. Just give it another second. Looks like you are settling on less than 5%. At so that that's about half of you, 48%. Just under half of you are saying 5 to 15 percent, so 10 percent is, is the third choice, more than 15. Okay, that's interesting for us. Thank you so much, John. I'm going to turn this over to you. And thanks, Tiffany. Yeah, and I'm quite interested by both what Kim and Vivek said there. When we look at it, I mean, both of them made a similar comment. This time it could be different. And 
And when you look at the last few years, it feels like the Donald Rumsfeld unknown unknowns is exactly what's been hitting us. We've seen Brexit, we've seen COVID, we've seen war in Europe for the first time in, uh, in what, 70 years. So it, it does feel a bit different. Uh, but I think we've got to look through the lenses that as pension scheme trustees or executives that we need to do to uh, say what's important for us. We've heard a lot about the short term here. I've got to remind us that actually we're very long term investors. So actually that is what is important to us in the long term. But, but where do we sit? So let's look at the world of DB. So in DB, a lot of our DB pension schemes have benefited enormously from the uh, LDI dislocation last year, the rise in gilt yields, which has seen those that were fully funded and hedged, actually just the assets and liabilities forwards massively. So much more attractive for the uh, sort of the, the sponsor and potentially moving towards buyout. And indeed, even for those that were not fully hedged and still open, again, many of those have seen their, their uh, funding level improve markedly. So quite a change and really opens, up, opens it up, I think, to really saying, would I expect to see more fixed income in the portfolio? Yes, I probably would. One, it's an investable asset at these sort of yields, even if there is future yield uh, enhancement, as, as Vivek sort of potentially mentioned there. Uh, but at three and a half percent, that doesn't sound too bad. And we've got some matching. And I think the pressures that could come with LDI there and potentially increased regulation, legislation, reporting and other things could mean actually investing in the physicals is, is where we need to go, which is which has some challenges. I think for the for the open DB schemes, and there aren't that many of them that I could branch some big uh, private sector, but also, of course, all the local government schemes, obviously, they can take a much longer term view on this. And I think what we're going to see in the UK, obviously, is uh, globally is, is this threat of recession. My concern is that the central banks and others have not been particularly good at uh, forecasting the way into inflation. Will they be as good forecasting the way out of inflation? We really get to where they expect uh, uh, in time. And obviously, we saw from the from the survey earlier that we're expecting as, a, as, as this group slightly higher than when we entered into the uh, into into the pandemic. So something that is a little bit more about above two, two percent. So there's a risk there. And, and obviously, the home bias that uh, some pension plans still have significant potentially looks significantly less attractive uh, with the UK threatened or or predicted to be one of those that actually has a more significant, a deeper and longer recession. Although the last uh, figures that came out suggested it is going to be shallower and flatter, but who can tell? So what I'm thinking about is yeah, for the long term, we shouldn't have any sort of knee-jerk reactions. Picking up on Kim's point, I think there is a there is something to be said there around opportunities that might come. And with opportunities, that means flexibility. Picking up that final survey point around the amount in the liquids, I'm aware that lots of DB schemes, in particular the more mature ones, are very overweight of liquids, and they've had to sell, uh, in many cases, some of their liquid assets to meet the liquidity cause under LDI. So I think there are going to be some people that actually want to offload those liquids. Uh, that might be an opportunity for, for D DC schemes, which historically have been very underweight in that market. Uh, but it also may be that the insurance companies who are looking to fund uh, and uh, back the uh, insurance buyouts and other things may, may be looking there. So I think there's a number of things that are, that are important. Move, so, but DB and, and LGPS, yes, being aware. But DC, uh, the vast majority is still very much two type asset classes. It's, it's, D, it's the, uh, the investment phase, the, the growth phase, very much still around uh, equities. And uh, we move into bonds to, to consolidate that position as people get closer to retirement and then as we de-risk into retirement. So I think there it's a case of what are the opportunities that come around this? Obviously, fixed income, as I mentioned previously, looks a bit more attractive. The world of equities potentially looks a bit more negative. Uh, it could be a bumpier ride, particularly in the next few years. What are we going to see? Credit may not look as attractive if we're going to see more defaults, if we go into recession and other things. So it's it's a challenge there. But I think the key is we have to think long term. We shouldn't be knee jerk. Uh, we can listen to our advisors, but uh, ultimately it's about trying to say, where do we think this will model out, reflecting the fact that no capital markets model actually uh, ever comes true. It's all very much a, a guess and a feel. But what we need to do is, is, uh, is ensure that we've got something that we believe gives the good chance of creating the pension adequacy that actually the PLSA uh, actually bangs the drum about, because that's what we're trying to deliver here, adequate pensions in retirement and uh, 
if we have a little bit less now, but actually we do get a mean reversion in the future and it comes good, that will still help to deliver that. So I'll pass back to you, Tiffany, and perhaps we'll, uh, we'll move into some questions. That's really fantastic, John. Thank you. I think that is really important to remember. I think most of us in the audience here today, you know, we we often, when we have our membership conversations one to one, and in our communities, we talk about the purpose of why we're here, why we're doing pensions, and it is about pensions adequacy. So that is underpinning this entire conversation. So thank you, John, for drawing that out. Um, you draw out issues around. Um, remembering that we're long-term investors um, and we shouldn't have knee-jerk reactions and and that actually the increase in re regulatory complexity does and will have a, a really a strong bearing on us as well. So I see we have a question that, that that's come through. We've got some questions as well here. Before we open up to the audience, can I just invite um, Vivek and Kim to give any initial responses to John? Because I know the three of you uh, have had chats before and listening to you in, in the briefing sessions has been really wonderful. So I would love it if you could uh, respond to John and and, and give the audience um, a, a sense of, of your reaction to, to his position. Vivek? Sure, happy to happy to go there. So um, I think I very much agree with John that this is this is about the long term when we're thinking about pensions. I think we we should never lose sight of that. I think the thing I would say is that you know when we look to that second poll, I think that's ninety seven percent of people thinking they should be changing their portfolio in some way. Um, and I guess the the point I would make here is that we need to assess: are these drivers that we're talking about just a near term blip, or are they something that is more longer lasting? And in my view, they are something that's more longer lasting. I think that if you were to believe that, then maybe it's it's a, it's a question as to whether or not you just need to reassess, is this mix still appropriate for the future? And, and the points I would make with regards to that, we talked about some of this already, the demographics point that we talked about before, uh, you know, that is, uh, that is something that isn't necessarily or obviously going to change anytime soon. You could find a situation whereby, um, you know, maybe some, uh, to Kim's point, maybe some countries benefit more from these trends than others. Maybe those that kind of are more appealing for people to live in. So if those that can attract more migration, maybe they will do comparatively better uh, with regards to the influx of, of labor and therefore keeping some of those supply constraints down. But it's a, it, if across the world, it's a demographic challenge, then then it's hard to see how it's a good news for, for, for the majority. And the other two points I'd mentioned, the geopolitical dynamic, hard to see how uh, you know the US and China get to a materially different place than where they are now. Even when we've had some positive news over the last couple of months with you know uh, the president's uh, Biden and Xi trying to put a floor under the worst, we see the balloon incident from the last uh, couple of a couple of days. And so this is going to be the new new dynamic. Friend shoring, as we've heard earlier, is going to be more prevalent. But in general, this is an environment where uh, you know it's not about economic economics first, right? It's about sort of things like national security. Uh, and that's the political driver. So I think that again is a trend that is longer lasting. It's not just a year. And then the final final point I'd make is, um, touched a little bit on this, the transition towards uh, net zero. Uh, you know, whether or not we hit a certain date or, or not, um, I think that's secondary to the point that in general, uh, economies are, uh, sort of uh, shifting. They're, they're shifting the way in which they um, uh, are trying to operate. The, the, the preferences we have as consumers are shifting. And I think that in and of itself is a contributor to higher inflation. So those three points I just mentioned, net zero transition, demographics, uh, geopolitical uh, kind of concerns, they seem to me as like structural points, which mean that we there are some implications over the longer run. I think we should be considering an allocation. Fantastic. Thank you, Vivek. Kim, do you want to come in? Yes. Um, John, thanks for that. It was a really interesting and, and you know, I, I totally agree. I mean, the, 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 what I would say, first of all, is if, if we try and put a frame around this that makes sense uh, for pension plans, um, what's really clear is that economic logic is not the number one priority anymore. Right. Except for us. Um, but for the world at large, it has become less important than national security. It's sad, but that's kind of the way we are. So the way I look at it is that the way this unfolds is that these structural breaks that we're seeing now, the breaking of links, every economic and probably cultural link as well between Russia and the West, that's structural. It's not coming back. Um, the 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 gradual erosion of links between China and the US, that's also looking pretty structural. Um, I think the only way you would see that redress is if there were a fantastic change 
I mean, fantastic in the in the, trying to show that it's not likely, in my view, uh, change of regime in 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 China with a different worldview. Um, the, in the world where we are accustomed to democratic, you know, political change every four or five years, depending on the country, we are used to thinking about things could change pretty radically from one administration to another, even if it comes down to pure economic policy. I think going forward, we're going to see less of those. And perhaps the, the link between the Biden regime and the Trump regime vis-a-vis -vis China is a good indication of, of what's coming. Um, what that means is that for investors, there are probably only going to be three centers of economic gravity going forward. One of them is the US, the other one is European Union, and the other one is China. And, and what that, if we if we accept that that's something that's tra relatively transparent and, and, and credible, then we can start to think about where we position ourselves accordingly. There are going to be areas of our universe of investments, you know, investment universe as it was a year ago, that are no longer going to be accessible or the, the risk reward calculation is going to be prohibitive. And there are going to be areas that previously we thought were pretty dull and actually going to end up pretty, att pretty attractive. So that's kind of the way I would frame it. And um, and I think, and I, I do reiterate, I mean, at the end of the day, every shift of regime or era, or whatever words we want to use, it actually throws up a lot of opportunities. So I'm I'm hugely optimistic. Again, with, with with the optimism, I love it. So um, before I turn it to the questions in the audience, and this is fantastic, we've got nearly a half hour to just have a, a really gentle conversation with our audience members on different issues. Um, does John and Vivek want to comment on anything else before we start with some, some questions? No? Okay. So we've got some from the audience, and um, but I think I'll start us off with a gentle a gentle question uh, from a colleague of ours who I think is in the audience. Um, so Marcin asked this question, and I think it's on my mind as well. What does the panel think about what does the climate in, the investment climate mean for the 60-40 portfolio split? Who wants to go first? We've all kind of come. Well, I'll, I'm still on, so I guess I'll, I'll I'll answer, even though it's really John's department. But I mean, from from my perspective, um, you know, you can make a case um, temporarily that that you need to change this dramatically. But at the end of the day, I, I believe that any change is going to be small. I mean, to the next point earlier, depending on where you're you are in your liabilities, you know, profile, that's going to determine essentially how much you vary from this. But certainly on a five-year view, I would be tempted to maybe um, take a bit off the equity allocation and put it into another asset class. It could be privates. It could be maybe a particular subdivision of, of, of fixed income. Um, and I think what might be exciting, I don't want to throw something controversial in here. I'm going to say that you know maybe on a 10-year view, or maybe even less than that, I don't know, because things tend to develop pretty quickly these days. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing an allocation to um, a new class of illiquid uh, assets, as you're saying, John, you know, and that is uh, ones that have become possible because of blockchain technology, for example, or tokens, you know, that are on the back of, of blockchain technology. So, for example, you might be able to buy a fraction of, um, I don't know, Buckingham Palace, you know, or um, a fraction of, uh, you know, uh, you know, rail pens, um, you know, uh, network, or I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, something that, that previously was not uh, accessible to investors. And the way, the way I kind of think, maybe just clarify, in today's world, we're accustomed to thinking that a retail investor gets access to a relatively defined universe of assets. Um, an institutional investor, like a pension plan, gets a wider universe, gets access to a wider universe. And a government obviously gets access to a different universe that even institutions don't get access to. Well, in, in this kind of world, I think maybe in 10 years' time, you know, you may find that actually everyone can access pretty much everything. And that that's kind of a revolutionary, controversial thing to throw on the table. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll come in next. I mean, I, I don't hear pension schemes having debates that start with 60-40 anymore. You do in North America, you don't hear, uh, because I think we've got, very much in, in the world of DB, a lot of schemes that have closed many years ago, their journey is more 90-10. Uh, 
the 10 is in equities literally to go or growth assets literally to give them some sort of longevity sort of protection if they haven't got a hedge in place and things like that. Uh, and actually some of our longer term open schemes uh, could be more 70, 30 or something like that. But with, with increased diversification, as Kim said, with other asset classes in there that give you non-correlated returns, you can actually afford to put a bit more in growth than the traditional 60, 40 in equities and, equities and bonds. So for me, uh, I, I don't think that's how we think. I think one of the great things that came out of scheme-specific funding is we think about things as the right thing for our scheme in its development and growth. We should explain, expect, as, as Vivek said, the asset allocation to change as we see opportunities or need to lock down risk or, or, or seek return at different points. So uh, for me, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's dead in the UK. Yeah. Dead in the UK, strong words, Vivek. Could you give us your, your view on this? No, I mean, I'm, I'm going to agree very much with, with with that last point. So I think the idea of it, we shouldn't kind of have the assumption, I think, that, to, that the starting point was the 60-40 was right for UK pension funds. To, to John's point, I think people have been a lot more specific than that for a period of time. So I'm going to generalize to some degree. I'm going to say, like, let, let's whatever it was before, is that still the right broad mix, right? And, and then to Kim's point, I mean, I think that at an aggregate level, if you're taking a certain level of risk because that was appropriate for you and you still need to take the same risk because you're not de-risking or you're not, you're not shifted in that regard, if you are in that camp, then, you know, ultimately this, the risk is tied to the objectives you broadly have and therefore it's not obvious why the headline mix should shift. But the mix within those assets, I think, could look very, very different. Typically, certainly to like this sort of, you know, if you think about the capital T, 60-40, 60-40 in like aggregate equity, aggregate bonds, that, that feels like the wrong the wrong kind of mix because to some of the points that, that Kim made at the start, which I very much agree with, granularity is going to matter much more when you're thinking about asset allocation, right? The We shouldn't just assume that this big kind of uh, mix of assets called, uh, I don't know, um, investment grade credit, uh, as defined by market cap, is necessarily the right thing for us to invest in. There, there could be, because of the things we've heard, there could be like regions that benefit more. There could be sectors that benefit more. We think that that dynamic actually is really important when it comes to thinking about the net zero transition and the asset allocation implications of this. So to generalize then, I guess I would say it's not obvious that it's the right place to start with. But if you're kind of more broadly taking it as like the risk level and assuming that risk level is the same, it's not obvious that the risk level necessarily needs to shift. But the mix of assets, I think, looks materially different to those traditional models, particularly employed in the United States. OK, fantastic. A clear message coming out there, basically not an obvious place to start. And essentially for the UK is not, in fact, um, the, the place to start at all. So, OK, um, this question from the audience is from John Bayliss. Uh, he, this, this is directed to Kim. Where does the UK sit in that hierarchy of being able to raise debt finance, both country and UK based companies? So start off with Kim and then if, if, if uh, Vivek and John want to add as well. Sorry, I always forget to press the mute button. Um, yeah, John, thanks for that question. Um, uh, you know, it pains me to say uh, as a British citizen that we don't sit particularly well right now um, because, uh, you know, I remember a uh, long time ago, somebody, I can't remember who it was, might have been somebody I was half listening to said, um, you know, that that influence and and, um, and your, your good name is, is uh, very hard to build up and it takes a long time, and it's very easy to lose it. And I think, was it the Financial Times that invented this thing called the moron premium? I mean, I, th <laughs> I think it was phenomenal wording, because essentially what it showed is that this relatively staid, predictable economy called the UK, um, always, you know, fiscal rectitude, you know, generally speaking, et cetera, et cetera, was someone that the bond markets didn't really think too much about. They kind of accepted a level of, of credibility to it. And then all of a sudden, um, the guardrails were off and uh, we came up with something that was really quite astounding. Um, and, and I think that's an event that damages the UK standing. There's no two ways about it. It's, it's going to add whatever, I don't know how many basis points to, to the opening uh, discussion on, on debt issuance. Uh, I think at the time it was 90 basis points. I don't know what it is right now, but um, the bottom line is once you've done something like this, it takes a long time to to get over it. And the way I I kind of explained it was um, to colleagues, I said that to, to me, it's like 
you've got a neighbor, you know them quite well, you don't know them brilliantly, but you know, they're okay, they're nice people. And your kids go to the same school as theirs, so you do car shares. And then one day you find out that this chap's actually been drinking and driving. Well, it's gonna be a very long time before your kids get in his car, right? So this is kind of the uh, the attitude I think that that investors are having. It does. It's not terminal, right? Let's be clear, uh, but it does mean that you know we're likely to have to be a bit more humble for a while and just you know toe the line and and follow the textbooks uh, so that hopefully people forget about it or someone else does something more stupid sooner. And then you know in the meantime we get we appear reasonable by comparison. Vivek, did you did you want to add anything to that before we move uh, on? No, similar theme. I think you know the the point I made in in my comments was, uh, you know, this idea that the the damage that we saw at the time. You could look at bond deals now and say, well, maybe that's in the rearview mirror. But I would very much echo the point that that, that Kim made. Like once the eyes of the bond markets have been like laser focused on 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 us for a period of time, it means that they're more quick, likely to quickly react to something that happens in the future. And that's why I think, you know, for for us, if if the um, if you think about what, what what did the government do to try and sort of calm markets to some degree, it was to try and come up with a, a plan that they said made the books balance. But a lot of the cuts that are implied by that plan are past the date of the next general election. So as the next general election comes into focus, markets, I think, will again start to question whether or not it's this government or another government, uh, well, how credible is that plan going to be? And therefore, what does that mean to the term premium I associate with UK bonds? So I think this hasn't gone away. Uh, and even if we can't see it uh, as much now in today's pricing as we could before, I think it's something that's more likely to come into the future because of the events of last year. Okay, fantastic. So in a, in a, in a similar vein, linked to, to what we've just been discussing, Keith asks a question on LDI. So do you think the parliamentary inquiry into LDI will result in further structural changes as the leverage has already declined? So um, I know, John, you have been involved in our, in our response as well. Um, and, and that, do, you, do you want to come in and comment on that? Yes, I'll come in on that. Obviously, I was involved when the, this was all going live and I was involved in the PLSA's discussions with the Bank of England and with TPR. And it, being, it was very clear that there wasn't an understanding across the industry around actually what's the degree of leverage? How do these things really work? I think many trustees originally sold this as, oh, you're, you're taking away an unrewarded risk. That's very rarely the case. You're often swapping risks. When it comes to this particular issue, though, I mean, what's become very clear is that this nearly broke the wider economics financial system. And that's something that isn't sustainable going forward. So my fear, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the PLSA view or a rail pen view at all here. It's my personal view is that I think we are likely to see more regulation. I think we're likely to see more reporting. I think we know that the, uh, the collateral requirements, the headroom required has moved up markedly from the uh, from the managers. Uh, I think that may come down over time, but not uh, not uh, quickly. And I think we have to remember that one of the big challenges here was it was the velocity of the change. It was a magnitude of change that we hadn't seen. We'd seen decline over 20 years in, in yields, and then we saw all undone over a matter of uh, days and weeks. That's, that's a really unexpected environment. So my fear is, yes, we're probably going to see a lot, a lot of regulatory intervention. The House of Lords uh, comments about should the PRA should look at this because it's more like some of the banking products. Uh, as a, a pension scheme that runs its assets in-house, that would make me regulated by the FCA, the PRA and the TPR. I don't think that's sustainable. Uh, so I think there will be something quite quite radical happens here. I think there'll be a lot of challenge. I think the PLSA will be right up there in the debate in terms of uh, what is the right solution going forward. Uh, but you've also got to look at the managers of LDI. They've seen that the assets shrink enormously. They've probably seen the word workload increase. So I, they must really be struggling in terms of fees and actually how they resource this to make this work for them going forward. And so I, I think for, for pension schemes, there is probably some threat that uh, costs of LDI will not be at the levels that they have been historically mm -hmm. uh, to, to accommodate potential this extra reporting that is required. So uh, I'm a little bit fearful about this one, but uh, it always takes a good uh, crisis to make a drama, doesn't it? <laughs> 
I, I like that. Um, and, and and I think I would tend to agree that we will be seeing a lot more in this space, in the regulatory space. It's it's, it's not going to go away uh, qu quietly or easily. So uh, to those of us in the audience who are who followed us, um, our work with the LDI, so so just watch the space and we'll be in contact if uh, um, more work comes through here, which I'm sure it will, as John says. So um, Vivek or Kim, did you want to add anything about the LDI crisis and okay so I'm just going to move on to another Kim you came on mute did you want to say something on that no okay no sorry so, it was accidental okay. <laughs> uh, so we just just changing um position a little bit so it's it's great we've, we've got over 10 minutes still that we we can have a, a conversation with our audience with um in DC land so we've got a question from Craig. He is asking, do we think we should be rethinking the asset allocation for lifestyling strategies, whether bonds can be considered de-risking in light of the events surrounding the mini budget last year? So again, in the same vein, specifically thinking about DC land uh, and decumulation, lifestyling strategies, et cetera. What do we think? I can start if you like. I mean, I look, uh, when, you, when you're de-risking, you've got to be thinking, what are you trying to achieve here? Where are you aiming for? So I think a lot of us have been considering, what are we, are we aiming for encashment because they're taking it somewhere else because it's, it's actually bundled in a scheme and we can't offer the, uh, the solutions, but is it annuities, which may become a lot more popular after the, uh, after the uh, sort of LDI crisis and yields going up. So annuities look a lot, more, lot better value than they have recently, or is it some other solution that people are looking for? So you've always got to consider where your lifestyles are going and what the, beats the, the needs of the membership. Uh, obviously, what we saw last year in the DC world was a number of uh, a number of membership groups, DC members, who just saw a massive decrease in the value of their pot, which they were not expecting. Uh, I don't think anybody was expecting it, and I don't think any trustee could have reasonably be expected to, for, to to look at it. But I think we have to look at the balance between cash and uh, and uh, and uh, the, the fixed income skills. So historically, some trustees have been reluctant with it in cash when there's been effectively a, a drag. You've not, you've got no return and you've paid a fee for putting it there. So truly protective. So are there other protective assets we can put it in that have got the liquidity re required? Uh, potentially there could be. It's interesting because things like gold are always seen as a great inflation hedge when you've got things running in that, in that direction. Uh, don't usually lose value at that time. So uh, might we consider some non-conventional assets in what is a, an area where typically it's been cash or bonds? I think there may be some opening up of, uh, of discussion around that. But yes, it's very unfortunate for, for, for members who've lost, but who see their asset value go down. But if they were looking at annuitizing, actually the benefit they may receive at the end may be very similar to that before the cash before the crash i think the challenge will be for those that were looking just to take the whole thing out as cash who suddenly had seen a pot that may have gone down by 30 percent. so i agree with craig's view i do think we need to reconsider again i don't think this is a baby in bathwater thing but we just need to understand what the the needs and uh, expectations for our members are so needs expectations um perhaps annuities will be coming back into fashion as john says um Vivek, Kim, did you have any comments about the DC asset allocation? Do you Happy to make just a, a, a quick one, I guess. Uh, I, I would agree with, with John, the idea that I think fixed income is always going to be the kind of dominant uh, sort of uh, asset in, in the, that de-risking phase, because even if it's not, uh, even if it's riskier than it was before, it's it's likely, uh, I believe, to be less risky than equity. But I think the thing we've got to consider here is, you know, part of the logic has been to, I guess, kind of move us towards something that allows us to buy annuities or whatever it might be. Another part of the logic has been this idea that whenever equities crash, fixed income will do well. And there's like an, an inevitability about that. And I would challenge that inevitability a bit more. I think that the you know, you've seen in the last couple of years, the correlations are what they were historically. I don't anticipate them going to be, uh, they're going to be positive in the way that they have been. Um, but I would anticipate they're less negative than the past. So I think at the margin, you do rethink. Um, and I think to, to the point that, that, that John made there, I think like cash versus broader gilt, I think a nuance here could be maybe it's more the shorter dated end of the gilt market rather than the longer dated end of the gilt market, because you do get that income, but you also have some of that protection and maybe there's a middle ground there. So that was the point. I would make. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Kim, did you want yeah. to comment? Yeah, the only the only thing I'd like to add there is just to you know, expand a little bit on this and because you know I think I, I agree with it is that what it actually tells me is that 
it becomes more of a um, tailor-made approach for each fund. Because depending on a whole series of variables, you know, you're going to look at things slightly differently and that could have a big impact on, on the answer to that question. And, and I really, you know, I don't know, when I did my MBA, it all seemed very simple. You know, they were, they were kind of telling us that basically it's one size fits all. They didn't use those words, but that was kind of the approach, you know, 60, 40 and all that. That's where it all comes from. Right. But actually, I, I think what we've learned over the last, you know, even just a couple of years is that it pays to just be almost forensic and and absolutely specialist solution for each each client. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So I'm going to move us back into ideas around monetary policy and inflation. So we have a three pronged question from a colleague around this. So I won't throw them all at you. We'll take them one at a time. Uh, so the broad kind of setting the, the scene for this particular question or three point question is monetary policy has continued to converge across developed markets with the Fed, ECB and Bank of England all increasing interest rates this last week with expectations that rates are soon to peak. Central banks have all made positive noises that they will be able to take control of inflation by the end of the year. So the first part of the three prong question is to what extent is there still reputational damage from how they misjudged inflation previously labeling it as transitory? Should we be more cautious is part A and we'll come back to the other ones. Who wants to go first? In fact, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. And, and the reason why I'm, I'm coming in is that um, for better or worse, uh, you judge. Uh, I happen to work with a bunch of ex-central bankers uh, at my firm and in my team. And uh, what is interesting is the dynamic that they talk about, and they, they're still kind of friends with the great and good in this environment, is that if given the choice between being the lady or gentleman who lost control of inflation or being the lady or gentleman who caused the recession, no one wants to be the person who lost control of inflation. And I think the bias, therefore, and I think you're seeing that in some of the prepared remarks, is that if given that choice, that tougher trade-off that I mentioned before, inflation is the priority. That is still viewed by many as a number one job, uh, even if uh, if the Federal Reserve has more of an explicit dual mandate. So I think we are right to be a little bit more cautious and actually uh, not, not viewing quite the same. I think that's a really well-made point. Um, you know, what I would suggest is that, you know, we've we've got a, a central bankers have had to change um what the you know the original textbook of central banking um said several times i think in 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 my career i mean it's absolutely you know we, we use this word unprecedented a lot and it kind of annoys me but i find myself having to use it again because you know think about qe that was unprecedented think about you know the longest ever flagged interest rate rise you know, uh, you go back, you could stretch it to maybe 15 years. You know, I mean, the, the bottom line is inflation did run away. And, and I totally agree with Vivek's point there about, you know, prioritizing what you want to be known for. But um, the 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 thing that sticks with me is that um, it's actually going to be harder for central banks going forward to remain totally independent, even in countries that have a tradition of independent central banking. And let me just clarify what I mean by that. If we go back to one of the things we mentioned right at the top of this call was demographics. And we kind of fleetingly, you know, address the fact that, you know, we're all getting a little bit older every year. But um, what, what I want to say there is that, you know, think about the importance of inflation control in a population where 50% of your population is, you know, approaching 65 or you know, a big chunk of it is. If you think about, you know, the US, which we don't think about as being a, an aged nation, you know, in the US, the last election, 17% of the registered voters were over 65. And that percentage is set to double in the next 20 years. As you the proportion of population that depends on a fixed income of a pension grows, that materializes into significant political pressure on governments to do something about inflation. So whilst I was talking earlier about, you know, there's several structural things that are going to keep pushing inflation probably higher for the next, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years. Um, I think it, it on the one hand, I don't think the 2% theoretical nominal kind of target that we've been used to thinking about is going to hold for that period. And at the same time, I see a convergence of pressure downward again on inflation that's coming from voters. 
Um, at the end of the day, you know, my mom's 88. She has a fixed income and a pension. Um, if you tell her that the GDP of the country has gone from 2% to 3%, she'll think oh, that's very nice. I don't see how that changes my life. But if you tell her inflation has gone from 2% to 3%, she knows exactly what that means. So I think this is this is one of the realistic, um, uh, the real world, I think, problems we're going to have going forward that we're going to deal with central banks that become really quite pressured, um, you know, on, on to prioritize that part of their um, objectives. Thank you so much for that. So sticking with the idea of um, inflation, and we, we talked a lot about sort of structural changes and geopolitics. So this prong two of that question about monetary policy and inflation, with China's economy expecting to reopen, since the change of stance on COVID, will that not drive up the need for energy? So China energy at a time which is relatively short supply, therefore actually increasing energy prices with an inflation knock on. What's your reaction to that? Can I can I jump in there um, on this one just quickly because uh, it's top of mind. Um, so first thing to say is that China turned on a sixpence this um, zero COVID policy, right? Um, that was unexpected because it's clearly not properly planned. Um, the hope that the Beijing seems to have is that you get enough of the enough of the people build up immunity very quickly and then you get going again. We know in Europe and and you know from experience in the US as well that it's a very bumpy road to reopening. And um, there are variants that come out very frequently. So we'll have to see. I would suspend my my belief right now on, on just how radical that, that old reopening is going to be. I think it's going to be complicated. Um, the second point I'd make is that, you know, China on the energy front specifically has essentially filled, as far as we can tell, their strategic reserves in the first half of last year. Um, so they don't actually need a heck of a lot of buying right now, they will doubtless continue to take advantage opportunistically of good pricing. Uh, in the past, China has been a big buyer of oil. Um, they have been very scrupulous at managing the dependence between Saudi Arabia and, and Russia. It's been 16% each of their imports. Going forward, maybe that tilt will change. It'll be more towards Russia because at the end of the day, they can name the price they're prepared to pay you know, for, the, for Russian oil. Uh, and that's likely to be structural. In terms of the gas market, which really affects us more, um, the setter of prices for uh, LNG prices last year and, and up until very recently was actually Europe, including the UK, I mean, the geography, Europe. Um, so we are now at a point where, uh, whereas in a typical year, Europe would end up in the 1st of April with 20% of its gas reserves um, you know, in place, we're likely to end up through a mix of good fortune and, and fast moving and high prices paid, we're going to end up with 60% um, at the end, on the 1st of April. What that means is that our requirement to fill the deposits again for next year, next year's winter, which could obviously be a tougher one, um, that is going to be easier to accomplish. And that means that we're no longer there pushing the price up internationally. So, um, what on the oil? Going back to the oil, just before I finish, one factor that we must bear in mind: the oil price, uh, oil market, is that Russia will have to, by default, uh, cut its production over the, this year, probably to as much as one and a half million barrels a day, and that kind of represents about one and a half percent, roughly, of the world market. And the reason for that is because um, most of the production is coming from brownfield sites that are relatively old, and they need a lot of oil service special knowledge and techniques, which right now, because of sanctions, they don't get access to. All right, thank you, Kim, so much. Vivek, do you wanna comment on that before we start to start our wrap up? We've got about another 90 seconds. Okay, so um, we're unfortunately coming to the end of our webinar. It's it's such a shame because I feel like there's so much more we we, we, we could say and talk about. Um, but before we close out, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to, because we we really kind of took the whole tour today, right? We, we talked about, uh, Alice, uh, allocation across our different memberships. So, you know, we've got DBL, GPS, Master Trust, DC. We talked about um, uh, the importance of the purpose of pensions and adequacy. We, we, we talked about uh, how there might be new opportunities with, with, with the liquids and um, the impacts of inflation and, you know, the whole gamut. So I would like our panelists to please choose one message 
of all the things that we've talked about today to leave with our audience members because I know there's, there's a lot. So what is your key message for them to think about? So I'm going to go to John first because he's giving us giving me a big smile. So John, I'm going to go to you first. That was just fear you saw then. That wasn't a smile. Uh, <laughs> what, what I was going to say was, I, look, I think when trustees are thinking about this year and in governance committees, it will be about, yes, what should we consider that perhaps we haven't considered before? Let's be open to new things uh, and diversification could be your friend. Fantastic. Uh, Vivek, do you want to go next? OK, I think this is a new regime. I think we do need to think about portfolios a little bit differently, not throwing everything out, but what worked before might not necessarily be the best thing to position you for in the future. Fantastic. Kim? So um, my takeaway from this is the future is bright, but you do need to change the lenses in your glasses. And I don't mean put in rose tinted. I just mean be aware you've got to look through a different prism than you did before. Kim, I knew you, you, you'd leave us on a high note, on an, opti on an optimistic note. So thank you so much. I, I'm re actually really sad that we have to end this session because I think both three of you are fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing with us your insights, your expertise. Um, our members will know how to get in touch with you, I think, after this session. Uh, so really just to thank all of you for, for your time. Um, if any of you in the audience have any questions for the panelists or, or for us at the PLSA, please do get in touch. And the last thing to say is to thank John, Kim, Vivek, um, our colleagues in the back as well for the tech uh, running and um, and all of you in the audience for being so patient um, and listening and for your questions. So thank you. See you next time. Thank you.